our speaker, Chief Justice Jean Haver Toll of the South Carolina Supreme Court, is a graduate of the University of South Carolina School of Law and a diehard fan of the Gamecocks. Uh, she has a shrine to the Gamecocks in the den of her home on Wheat Street in Columbia, and there is also a special place in that den devoted to the Atlanta Braves. Uh, and I'm sure that our speaker, who is very active in her church in Columbia, has done lots of praying at those shrines through the years. Uh, of course, since 1991 or so, the prayers have been answered quite often for the Braves. You know, at least one World Series, we'd like them to go more often. But the uh, Lord's blessings on the Gamecocks have been a little more mixed. And, uh, uh, but however, uh, many of us here in the Bulldog Nation fear that those who wear the garnet and black of Carolina, just as told I have a garnet and black tie on, in your honor, uh, we fear that the, uh, they have turned to the dark side of the force, uh, Satan, when uh, they hired the evil genius Steve Spurrier to, uh, to lead and coach the football team. So uh, strike me down, Lord, but I hope he is not the savior of the Gamecocks. Now, uh, I've also, uh, I also mentioned Columbia. That's our speaker's hometown, and uh, born and raised there, but for going to college at Agnes Scott and practicing law for a short time in Greenville. Now, I lived in Columbia for 13 years until 1990 and can attest that it is a great place to live. Now, it rivals Macon, Augusta, Columbus, Montgomery for awful heat and humidity uh, between late May and late September, but if you like politics, if you like law, if you like public policy, if you like higher education and all the associated gossip, intrigue, and jockeying for position, then you would love Columbia. Uh, it's the home of South Carolina. It's the home of the uh, law school, of course. Just about two blocks from the law school, you have the state capitol. The uh, Supreme Court is close by. The governor's mansion is close by. The uh, federal court isn't far away either. And there might be over half a million people in the metropolitan area, but it doesn't feel that big. There are lawyers and judges and legislators everywhere, and that makes it a lot of fun. Now, the heart of Columbia is the Shandon neighborhood, uh, the city's first suburb. It dates from the 20s, uh, maybe a little bit before that, and has a feel like five points here in, in Athens. And uh, I lived in that neighborhood, and so does uh, Justice Toll. Uh, the mayor of Columbia lives there. There are a lot of lawyers who live there. There are several members of the legislature who live there. The governor even lived there when they were renovating the governor's mansion. And in 1978, the late Senator Strom Thurmond lived in the neighborhood and campaigned for Senate, uh, ran a road race in the neighborhood, won his age division, and shook hands the whole way. Uh, I think he might have been the only person in his age division at that time. Uh, but he was great in the physical fitness. Now, Justice Toll got her start in that neighborhood. She was the top debater at Dreher High School. Uh, she was uh, then headed west to Agnes Scott. She was active with judicial counsel at Agnes Scott, goalie for the field hockey team. Then she went to law school at USC, graduating in 1968. Uh, there weren't many women in law school at that time. Uh, weren't many women in law school here. Weren't many women in law school at Carolina. Uh, she met her husband there, uh, Bill Toll, and after practicing uh, in Greenville, she came back and uh, established uh, her own firm or became part of the firm, uh, Belser, Baker, Barwick, Rabinal, Toll, and Bender. Her husband, incidentally, practices with Johnson, Toll, and Batiste, which was the first integrated law firm in South Carolina. Uh, Justice Toll did a lot of litigation uh, while she practiced. Uh, she was elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives in 1975 when she was in her early 30s and she served in the House until 1988, chairing several major committees, uh, providing four leadership in a wide variety of areas. Uh, I'm pleased to say she was always interested in administrative law, a subject that's uh, near and dear to me. Uh, while doing all that, she maintained a successful law practice and raised with her husband two very bright daughters. She was elected to the South Carolina Supreme Court in 1988, uh, she is the only woman, woman to have served as a justice on the uh, South Carolina Supreme Court, the first native Colombian to serve on the Supreme Court, and the first Roman Catholic to serve on the Palmetto State's highest court. And she was reelected uh, 
as Chief Justice in 2004. I could say a lot more. After all, if I had stayed at South Carolina, my daughter Shannon would have attended uh, Hand Middle School and Dreer High with, with her youngest daughter. Uh, they still have some mutual friends. Uh, Justice Toll has received many, many awards in her distinguished career, including the ABA's Margaret Brent Woman Lawyers of Distinction uh, of Achievement Award in honor of the nation's first woman lawyer. Thank you for joining us today to present the Edith House Lecture, uh, Chief Justice Jean Hafer Toll. Thank you, David and uh, Amy, and uh, to all of you for this wonderfully warm welcome. It is quite a, a daunting experience uh, to be the lecturer this year and follow in the footsteps of so many distinguished uh, women lecturers, many of whom I know personally. Shirley Abrahamson, one of your early uh, House Lecture Series uh, speakers, uh, is still the Chief Justice of Wisconsin and one of my dearest friends, as she is of Norm Fletcher, your own chief. Uh, and Sarah Weddington and many of the other uh, uh, lecturers you've had are, are uh, lawyers and uh, academics and judges well known to me. So I wonder that I can uh, stand in the footsteps of such a distinguished group of, of lecturers, but I will try. And of course, uh, what a great honor uh, to be uh, the House lecturer and to be uh, honoring the memory of a trailblazer. I am sometimes called a trailblazer, but when you talk of Edith House, you really are talking about a trailblazer. Well, my subject today is women in the law. And, you know, the big difference that I have noticed between men and women when they give these lectures is that men always start with jokes, and women just jump right into the meat of things. But I recently heard a joke. Uh, it's the only female lawyer joke that I really like, uh, and so I thought I might tell it to you to start today. Uh, it goes like this. How does a female lawyer change a light bulb? She holds the bulb and lets the world revolve around her. <laughs> it was not always so, and that is the subject of my lecture. In the last 30 years, the number of women lawyers has increased substantially so much so that women attorneys are finally in the position of being important players in the American legal profession. But America's historical background fills more than 200 years rather than just these two decades. The year is 1783. Elizabeth Freeman, a slave, appeared before the Massachusetts high court demanding her freedom. She claimed that under the state's Bill of Rights, as a native-born American, she was free and equal. The Massachusetts high court was so impressed with her argument that they granted her the relief she sought, her freedom. 1795, Lucy Terry Prince addressed the United States Supreme Court. She's believed to have been the first woman to do so. Prince, an African-American woman, successfully defended a land claim before our nation's highest court. It's not known exactly when women began first to practice law in the United States. Uh, as Dean Shipley has mentioned, many legal scholars believe that Margaret Brent was the first woman lawyer in America. It's a wonderful story. She arrived in the colonies in 1638 and was soon appointed as counsel to Lord Baltimore, the governor of Maryland. The colonists were so impressed with Margaret Brent's legal capabilities that they addressed her very respectfully as Gentleman Margaret Brent. She was an extremely competent lawyer. She handled over 124 major cases in an eight-year period, but she was never allowed a voice in the political arena because of her gender. Despite Brent's early start, women didn't officially begin to practice law in the United States until 1869 when Bell A. Mansfield convinced Iowa Judge Francis Springer to interpret the masculine words in the admission statute to apply universally, that is, to women as well as to men. The first woman law student in America was Lemma Berkelow. 
She was a Brooklyn woman who in 1868 traveled to St. Louis to get an education because no Eastern law school would admit her. She was one of those women that Dean George Templeton of Columbia Law School mentioned in his diary when he wrote at about this period, application from three infatuated young women to Columbia Law School. No woman shall degrade herself by practicing law in New York, especially if I can save her. The year is 1869, and Myra Bradwell, truly one of our sisters and trailblazers, was refused admission to the Illinois bar because as a married woman, her contracts were not binding. And of course, the contract is the essence of the attorney-client relationship. And therefore, that disability of contracting uh, prevented her from being admitted as a lawyer. The court in Illinois also proclaimed this about Myra Bradwell's uh, application. God designed the sexes to occupy different spheres of action. It belongs to men to make and apply and execute the laws. That, a quote from the decision in her case. The United States Supreme Court agreed with the Illinois court. Justice Bradley, concurring in the court's opinion, cited the natural differences between men and women as the reason that Myra Bradwell could not be admitted to the practice of law. A man should, is or should be woman's protector and defender. The nature and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex, a quote from the United States Supreme Court decision, evidently unfits it, the female sex, for many occupations of civil life. The year is 1870, and Ada Kepley becomes the first woman in the United States to graduate from a law school. And she was also the first woman to hold that position to actually practice in a court of law. In 1872, Charlotte E. Ray became the first black woman lawyer in the United States and the first woman lawyer in the District of Columbia. Uh, listen to this from the trustees of Howard University, which it was her uh, alma mater. They, they were, at Howard at that time, they examined you, the trustees examined you to decide whether you would graduate. And here's a quote, this colored woman who reads us a thesis on corporations not copied from the books, but from her brain, a clear, incisive analysis of one of the most delicate legal questions. She was a brilliant woman. She was a Phi Beta Kappa, an honors graduate from law school. She should have had national recognition, but instead, because of the prejudice against her by reason not only of her sex, but her race, she died in obscurity in Woodside, Queens. Women in the nation's capital had no better champion of their cause than one of my favorite uh, figures from uh, women's history, or herstory as we sometimes refer to it, uh, and that is Belva Lockwood. She was the woman responsible for opening up the federal courts to women lawyers. In 1879, she became the first woman lawyer to argue a case as a lawyer before the United States Supreme Court. To receive that honor, she had to try three times to get a special bill passed in the United States Senate to change the admission requirements uh, to the United States Supreme Court bar. She was enormously popular. She even ran for president in 1884 on the equal rights ticket, reasoning that although women could not vote, you remember we did not have the vote at that time, there was nothing in the law that stopped her from holding the office of president. It shouldn't surprise you that the refusal to face econ uh, political realities probably caused Belva Lockwood to face a lot of obstacles from the male legal establishment. In 1874, she tried to plead a case before the United States Court of Claims. She had a very active trial practice, but she had this case before the U.S. Court of Claims. Judge Charles Drake of that court silenced the courtroom looked over Belva Lockwood and said, uh, Mistress Lockwood, you are a woman, and refused to allow her to proceed with trying her case. Belva Lockwood later made this remark. She said, for the first time in my life, 
I began to realize that it was a crime to be a woman, but it was too late to put in a denial, so I pled guilty. Now, here, here's what Belva Lockwood had to do. She, she cared about her client. I mean, that was the, the, she had her eye on the ball. She was trying a case in the U.S. Court of Claims for a client, so they wouldn't let her try the case. She had to be sure the client was represented. So she hired a male replacement. But she bitterly complained, he was saying very badly in three days what I could have said well in an hour. Uh, well, these 19th century pioneers that I, I'm reciting to you faced a profession and a society that espoused what was called the cult of domesticity. It was a view that women are by nature different from men. They're fit for motherhood, home life, they're compassionate, they're selfless, they're gentle, they're moral, they're pure, their minds are attuned to art and religion and not logic. Men, on the other hand, according to the cult of domesticity, are fitted by nature for competition, intellectual discovery in the world. They're battle-hardened, shrewd, authoritative, tough-minded. Women were thought to be ill-qualified for adversarial litigation, a field I spent my whole uh, private uh, legal practice in because it required sharp logic and shrewd negotiation, as well as exposure to the unjust and immoral. In 1875, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, graced now for over 25 years by the presence of Chief Justice Shirley Abrahamson, but her predecessors had this to say to Lavinia Goodall, uh, who applied to that court for admission. They said, she couldn't be admitted to the state bar because the practice of law was unfit for the female character. Quote from the Wisconsin Supreme Court, to expose women to the brutal, repulsive, and obscene events of our courtroom life, the Chief Justice said, would shock man's reverence for womanhood and relax the public sense of decency. Indeed, when Lavinia Goodall died of rheumatic fever at the age of 41, the newspaper said it was proof that practicing law was dangerous to a woman's health. <laughs> now, we laugh now, but I mean, these were the things that were said at the time. And if women weren't too delicate, uh, too foolish, too frail to practice law, then there's always the final qualification. Now, this is in a letter to Yale Law School from George Sill, the Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut. Dear sir, a young lady has applied to me for permission to become a student of the law. Are you advanced enough to admit women to your school? In theory, I am in favor of their studying law and practicing law, provided they are ugly. <laughs> but I fear a handsome one before the jury. Now, Clarence Darrow, we all know, one of the great advocates uh, for the oppressed uh, and the downtrodden and for the uh, minority point of view. But even a distinguished trial lawyer like Clarence Dara, who frequently represented unpopular clients, uh, defending the evolutionists, for example, in 1925, he is looking straight at a group of women lawyers. And this is from a speech that Clarence Dara made to women lawyers in the 20s. You cannot become shining lights at the bar because you are too kind. You have not got a high grade of intellect. You can never expect to get the fees men get. I doubt if you can even make a living. I don't think Clarence Dyer could get up here at the University of Georgia or any place else and make that statement today. But another male attorney of that period commented, another reason not to have a woman as a lawyer. A woman cannot keep a secret, and for that reason, if no other, I doubt if anyone will ever consult a woman lawyer. So you can see in light of that kind of attitudinal uh, uh, mix at the time that Clara Shortridge Folks, she's the first woman lawyer in California. She's the first woman deputy district attorney in the United States. She got a little testy when an opposing attorney suggested in open court that she would be better off at home raising children. She retorted, a woman had better be in almost any business than raising such men as you. Uh, I can sympathize with Clara. I had to hold my tongue a lot of times in the early years uh, of, of my practice. Uh, uh, but with their inferior position in society and difficulty gaining the right to legal careers as well as the right to vote in public elections, it's some, somewhat surprising to think, that, think about this. 
All states admitted women to the bar by the year 1914, although the right to vote was not awarded to women until 1920. But despite these hard-won battles, the kind of Victorian attitudes I've been describing to you, uh, these attitudes about women followed us well into the 20th century. At Columbia University, Dean Harlan Fisk, an icon uh, in the legal profession, Dean Harlan Fisk Stone let it be known that women would be admitted to law school over his dead body. Fortunately for Stone, he was appointed Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court before the first class of women was admitted to Columbia University in 1927. Uh, remarkable, that short a period of time in the relative span of history. Uh, male students uh, 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 stomped their feet, interrupted women as they recited. They were not received in any kind of a uh, uh, sympathetic way at Columbia. Uh, at Yale, uh, same thing. Uh, uh, women were um, uh, uh, hooted down, abused, attacked uh, as they were admitted to the law school in the 20s. But Columbia and Yale at least let women in at that time. Think about this for a moment. Harvard Law School did not admit women until 1950. Notre Dame Law School did not admit women until 1969. Washington and Lee Law School did not admit women until 1972, well after I began the practice of law. And I suspect the only reason W&L let women in then is because in 1972, the American Bar Association finally announced the policy women had sought for so many years that in order to be an ABA accredited law school, you had to admit women. Now, the American Bar Association first admitted women into its ranks in 1918, but for many years they were given little meaningful role in the policy making. So, you know, it might be helpful to look at numbers and kind of see what the progress has been by the numbers. In 1910, just over 1% of the legal profession was women. By 1930, that figure had doubled because in the 20s, women had fought for and finally won suffrage. We had achieved access to all state bars. We had begun to serve on juries, and I'll tell you a little footnote about that for South Carolina's own history. But our gains were pretty short-lived after the 20s. The depression of the 1930s effectively slowed almost to a halt the admission of women into law schools in the United States so that our entry level remained low through the 1970s. Uh, I flashed to my own time. I graduated from law school at the University of South Carolina in 1968 uh, in a group of three women in my law school class. Uh, only 40 women were admitted to practice law at that time in South Carolina, uh, making it way less than 1% of the admitted lawyers in the state. Only 10 women were in active practice when I entered the profession in 1968, and women were not at that time in South Carolina allowed to serve on state court juries. South Carolina had never ratified the 19th Amendment, and it took a woman a Republican woman, interestingly. She was the mother of a classmate of mine at Agnes Scott, and she served in the South Carolina General Assembly in the late 60s, uh, Carolyn Frederick. She shamed those men into ratifying the 19th Amendment. And with that recognition of women's right to vote came the change in many other laws in South Carolina that excluded us, including state court jury service. And a really remarkable thing happened when we opened up state court uh, jury service to women. It's 1968, early 69. Uh, I am less than a year into the practice of law and toiling in the library of the Hansworth Law Firm in Greenville, writing briefs for those who actually go to court. Of course, I could never, would never be thought to let me uh, go into court uh, uh, even to deliver a paper, much less to uh, 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 argue a case or, or participate in a trial. And suddenly, Ms. Frederick's legislation, uh, which had passed the previous year, uh, comes to fruition, and jury pools begin to include women. There were many exemptions to jury service then, that, and they were job-related. 
And of course, they included jobs we mostly didn't hold because women were not in the professions or in any of what were called the protected categories from service on juries. So many women began to serve on juries, so much so that uh, in Greenville and Pickens County, where my firm practiced, we began to see some juries that were predominantly women and, and in some cases, all women juries. And I would go with uh, the lawyers uh, to these proceedings and see them argue in front of a jury. And it's kind of like that Clarence Dara quote of uh, the remarks he made to a group of women. You know, somehow, sometimes people will look right at an audience but won't really see the audience and will say some really remarkable things. They were making some of the most uh, uh, condescending uh, arguments to these panels of jurors that you could possibly imagine. Uh, and these women would be totally stone-faced, uh, not a reaction. And then they would go back into that jury room, and they would come out with some verdicts that would absolutely set the hair on end of these uh, colleagues of mine at the hands with the law firm. So they came to me finally and said, Toll, we're going to make you a litigator. It's very unusual. It's, it's way out, but we're going to do that because we have to have someone who can communicate with those women. And that's how I got my chance to become a litigator, and that's what I ended up doing my entire practice. Uh, now, in the early 1970s, less than 10% of law school graduates in the United States were women. So 1910, 1% uh, of the profession is women. By the 60s, 1% in South Carolina, 2% nationally. Still very little change. And then comes the 70s. Uh, today, close to half of uh, law school uh, uh, students are women. And, uh, uh, that's not only a national figure, but is beginning to be a pretty stable figure across the law schools throughout the country. Nearly 30% of all women are lawyers, and you may not consider that very remarkable. I consider it a revolution since I've been practicing law. And of course, all of those women are at the younger cohort of practice, which I consider to be anything below the level of where I am by way of years in practice. Uh, so you can imagine that it won't take too long before those numbers will spread out and increase dramatically, as will the numbers of women who become judges and become leaders in the profession. It just takes an available pool before we begin to see more diversity uh, in the profession. Uh, more women than ever now are becoming judges. Uh, only in 1959, only one woman, Florence Allen, had ever served on the federal appellate bench. Uh, today, nearly every federal circuit has at least two active women. For, in state court level, when I became Chief Justice five years ago, there were six of us. There are now 22 of us uh, in just that short period of time who are Chief Justices of state Supreme Courts. Uh, Finally, at the typical 200-plus lawyer firm, uh, women comprise 42% of the associates uh, and about 14% of the associates at uh, firms of that size uh, and larger uh, are minorities. I used to tell my closest friends in the early years when I practiced uh, in a rather lonely situation with very few mentors that if the men in my office ever figured out how close to the practice of law housekeeping was, menus, details, phone calls, organization, they'd leave the practice in groves and we'd have it all to ourselves. Uh, now, they haven't figured all that out yet. But partnership is another kettle of fish altogether. Despite the increasing numbers of women who are graduating from law school and serving as judges, women continue to be very underrepresented as partners in private law firms. As of 2002, only 16% of the partners in law firms nationally were women. And even though large numbers of women enter the associate ranks every year, quite a few women drop out of the race before reaching partnership. One of the major factors accounting for this problem of retaining talented female lawyers is the fact that society still places most of the burdens for child care and homemaking on women. Uh, of course, maybe uh, women's priorities have something to do with that, and I don't criticize that. Uh, having raised two girls myself, I know what those challenges are about. But I think today, for the first time, 
the young women I know who are moving up the law firm ladder can now look to female mentors to guide their way. And that's an awfully important part of keeping the ladder down and pulling up our colleagues into the higher rungs of leadership in law firms. Uh, historically, mentoring has always been a crucial part of making the run for partnerships because young associates learn how to be effective lawyers from partners or from seniors in the firm uh, who take them under their wing. Uh, the extra support that women who've been in the profession for a while are now providing uh, is, I think, an important part of what it will take uh, to increase diversity. Now, Let's talk about some of the feminist undercurrents, and you have had some solid lectures uh, for the House lecture from some much more sophisticated scholars in this area than myself. Uh, I, I've lived my, my uh, feminist undercurrents in the very practical uh, arena of, uh, of practice uh, uh, and uh, raising a family and trying to juggle a whole lot of things together. So I'm speaking from a practical side. Uh, rather than from an academic side. But many feminist writers are asserting that subtle cultural and institutional barriers still remain to women in the legal profession. They argue that cultural stereotypes operate to exclude women because qualities that are seen as typically male are also those associated with good lawyering. Uh, the reasoning is that women attorneys are perceived as non-assertive by their male colleagues, hence they are dismissed as lacking the aggressive personality necessary for the practice of law, or if they're assertive, and this is what used to happen to me, uh, women are chided for being too aggressive. It doesn't take being very effective before, oh, you're the B word, and you're too aggressive, et cetera. So it's a tough, tough, tough uh, balance. Uh, but there are two predominant strains of feminist thought regarding the question, will women be changed by the legal profession, or will the legal profession be changed by the increased presence of women? The first theory argues that the increased presence of women will make a substantial difference in the practice of law as women will adopt a more caring approach, value empathy, mediation over the previously adversarial, competitive, individualistic orientation. And this, quote, difference in viewpoint doesn't seem to consider the possibility that such values as mediation and negotiation really may have more to do with the nature of the work than they do with the gender of the legal practitioner. But the second theory argues that the law is so imbued with male domination that even though women are entering in record-breaking numbers, they'll have little success in transforming the traditional legal practice. These difference domination perspectives each suffer from limitations, it seems to me. The former, the difference uh, analysis, assigns women practitioners too much agency, and the latter, I think, assigns them too little. Both approaches are pretty one-dimensional uh, and view women as either demonstrating greater sensitivity to clients and adopting a nurturing attitude to legal dealings, or they view us as passive victims of male dominance. Many disagree with this kind of dichotomy of analysis, and among them uh, is one of my heroines, uh, and lucky enough to say one of my mentors, and that's Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, who ser currently serves on the United States Supreme Court. She observed this. Ironically, the move to ask again the question whether women are different merely by virtue of being women recalls the old myths we have struggled to put behind us, and certainly the recent uh, controversy at Harvard uh, indicates that those old myths are still there and we are still struggling uh, with them. Uh, Justice O'Connor says, however, more and more writers have suggested that women practice law differently from men. The gender differences currently cited are surprisingly similar to the stereotypes from years past that I recited to you uh, from case law. Uh, women attorneys uh, go the stereotypes, are more likely to seek to mediate disputes than to litigate them. Women attorneys are more likely to focus on resolving a client's problem than vindicating the client's position. Women attorneys are more likely to sacrifice career advancement for family obligation. Women attorneys are more concerned with public service or fostering the community than with individual achievement. Women judges are more likely to emphasize context and de-emphasize general principles. 
Women judges are more compassionate, and so forth and so on. She continued, This new feminism is interesting but troubling precisely because it so narrowly echoes the Victorian myth of the true woman that kept women out of the law for so long. It's a little chilling to compare those suggestions to Clarence Darrow's assertion that women are too kind and warm-hearted to be shining lights at the bar. Asking whether women attorneys speak with a different voice than men do is a question that is both dangerous and unanswerable. It again sets up the polarity between the feminine virtues of homemaking and the masculine virtues of breadwinning. It threatens, indeed, to establish new categories of quote-unquote women's work to which women are confined and from which men are excluded. Uh, that's a, a telling series of observations in a speech from Justice O'Connor, not yesterday, but in 1991 at New York University. Uh, perhaps Justice Lewis Powell, another of my favorite figures, uh, and someone uh, who practiced long enough before he became a member of the U.S. Supreme Court to be someone that a lot of lawyers like myself grew to know and uh, uh, see in the courtroom uh, in our practice. Lewis Powell put best uh, the alleged differences between male and female lawyers when he commented as follows. Uh, the qualities of mind, capacity to reason, logically, ability to work under pressure, leadership and the like, are unrelated to sex. This is demonstrated by the success of women in law schools, in the practice of law on the bench, and in positions of community, state, and national leadership. That's out of Hishon versus King and Spalding. Well then, balancing a career and personal life one major difference does remain, even though we're in these ostensibly uh, enlightened times. Women professionals are still significantly more responsible for child care, spending roughly twice as much time on this activity as do their professional husbands. These family responsibilities place additional burdens on women as they seek to progress in their careers alongside male attorneys who generally are not burdened to the same degree. But the modern day practice of law was developed at a time when our society was structured very differently, and that structure is changing uh, uh, happily, uh, in my view, before our very eyes. The typical law firm culture originated when men worked at the office and women stayed at home. And now that more women work outside the home, and now that women view raising a family as one of many options uh, open to them. Uh, I believe that many changes are being made in the world of work and the world of the law to accommodate these changes. Uh, I don't think motherhood, for example, needs to slow a woman's path to management. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, uh, skills we learn from a lot of different uh, activities in our lives. I do think that law firms are becoming more open to the idea because men are more open to the idea that they have a role to play, uh, whether as fathers or as nurturers or of younger uh, people in this world. So I think uh, in this generation of law students, you male and female law students have an entirely different idea about your place in society and your relationship to each other. And that is a positive thing for all of us as our profession begins to change. Uh, I would conclude in this way. At one time, the battlefields were dominated by men of similar background, education, and experience. This commonality allowed those who roamed there to have their own language, code, and rules, and everyone was essentially the same or thought so similarly that minimal explanation was needed. Women lawyers have encountered barriers grounded in established traditions and it's taken a great deal of time and effort on the part of many women to break these barriers down. But I would suggest that the ultimate elimination of barriers has to take into account people of color. Uh, it has to take into account sexual orientation. It has to take into account any differences that make us the unique individuals we are. And when we all feel is important enough in the profession to advocate for the diversity in all of us. 
then these barriers to any one of us or any group of us will begin to be eliminated. It is a rejoicing and exciting time to be a member of the legal profession as so much is changing. And my own personal history uh, is certainly proof positive uh, that uh, uh, outsiders can become insiders with a lot of uh, hard work and a lot of belief uh, uh, in the essential goodness uh, of this profession and its members. Thank you.